My name is Philip Brode. I'm the Executive Director of LSE Cities, a research centre at the London School of Economics dedicated to the analysis of global urban change and urbanisation. I will speak about cities and the new climate economy and specifically the role of urban form and transport. Now, if I refer to the new climate economy, this is both a concept, the idea of moving towards a climate agreeable, green, uh, more prosperous and inclusive economy, but it's also a program which was set up by the so-called uh, Global Commission for the Economy and Climate and its signature report, Better Growth, Better Climate, arguing that a climate policy and good economic policy can actually be mutually reinforcing. Now, I'm going to focus specifically on the role of cities and how urban form and transport needs to be at the center of this new proposition. And I'm going to structure my presentation in three parts. The first, we'll look at how urban growth and urban growth challenges need to be recognized as part of this argument. The second, we'll look at how we can move beyond business as usual. And the third one, we'll look at how we can enable better urban accessibility. Let me come to my first part, which is about uh, urban growth and growth challenges. Cities are all about the concentration of activities, of people, and we have seen in the latest statistics that we have about 50% of the world population being urban, concentrated in less than half a percentage point of the, land, of the world's land surface. More intriguing, it's about 80% of economic output that is concentrated in that area. That's an opportunity, but it also comes along with major challenges. If we're looking at climate change as a proxy indicator for environmental issues, we can see that about 76%, according to the latest calculations by the IPCC, are concentrated, emissions concentrated in these urban areas or are related to activities in these urban areas. So cities are a context within which we can sort of focus deep into specific locales, tackling questions of economic prosperity and at the same time environmental sustainability. So that's the static picture. Looking at the dynamics in terms of growth up to 20 30, we can see that it's a relatively small number of less than 500 cities which will produce more than 60% of economic output and um, potentially and problematically uh, more than 50% of global carbon emissions. So this is the space we need to really act and operate in. We need to recognize that the way we build cities today has a very long-term implication. We are locking in development, we are locking in carbon emissions for the future, and this is particularly important for those parts of the world which are rapidly expanding urban territories and built environments. And we also know that in the past we got it wrong. We have uh, estimates from our own work looking at the United States and uh, at the cost of urban sprawl, which we estimate conservatively to be at least in the region of 400 billion US dollars per year, if not even a trillion or more. Now the cost of poorly managed urban growth uh, is cuts across a whole range of different uh, areas, economic costs, environmental costs, social costs. I will not go into the details of these, but I want to highlight specifically uh, the carbon um, sort of challenge we have, and particularly in relation to, car uh, to the transport question. So transport accounts for about 23% of global energy-related carbon emissions. Uh, that's in itself a big number, but that's not the main problem. The main problem is that under current trends, we are going to see the doubling of these transport emissions by 2050. So it's uh, dynamically speaking the most problematic sector and one which needs urgent tackling. A lot of these urban transport emissions are um, related to road traffic and to an increasing motorization. About 10 billion trips today are um, made in, in the cities around the world and these are unfortunately increasingly uh, motorized. The degree to which the dynamic growth of carbon emissions related to transport are problematic can be seen if we look at some of the most sort of progressive areas which tried for the last decades to actually tackle carbon emissions, like the EU 27 member states. What you can see here are the emissions from 1990 up to 2006. And while sectors like energy, households, industry have sort of consolidated uh, carbon emissions, transport emissions are going through the roof. And I stress this is in a highly urban context and it is in a context which has a lot of policies and intention in place. So how can we move beyond business as usual? This is my second part, where I want to just rehearse very briefly what is actually business as usual. Business as usual at the moment means a threefold increase of urban land in only a period of 30 years from 2000 to 2030 hugely problematic, possibly the single most important challenge we need to tackle today, ideally reducing that increase, 
but certainly better managing uh, this increase of urban land. There is an associated increase of motorization, the number of vehicles in the world, privately owned mostly, where some statistics even suggested that by 2050, from today about a billion, we may reach three or three and a half billion vehicles. I will have to stress that I don't think this is going to happen with technology changing, uh, but this is sort of the statistical evidence which is the baseline of a lot of developmental scenarios, a lot of car companies working with, uh, and a lot of infrastructure investments being rolled out. Hugely problematic for urban development for the obvious reasons. Because it is related to what we consider the endless city. It's a city that sprawls into the horizon where transport is then only really achievable through motorized means and individual means of travel, mostly the motor car. Uh, we have seen this, for example, at the periphery in Mexico City, uh, a city then then only not only sort of expands beyond the uh, perimeter of the political city, making future uh, planning even more complicated, but already then results in enormous social and environmental costs, which I have alluded to earlier. Now, there is an alternative today already, uh, and this is an extreme, this is Hong Kong, where we see a uh, sort of accessibility through higher densities, greater mixed use, public transport orientation, and most importantly, walkability. So what we're seeing here in these sort of urban contexts is the possibility for urban residents to reach most of their daily activities within five to 10 minutes. The job trip is still the longest journey, maybe in the uh, region of 15 minutes on average, dramatically less than what we're seeing in other places. The key message here is that land use and the way we plan cities physically, how we lay them out, where we position uses and transport systems go hand in hand to then co-produce urban accessibility. And we can see this quite neatly if we're comparing places at equal wealth levels, but quite different socio, spatial, and most importantly, physical configurations. So what we're seeing here is Atlanta and Berlin, two cities, relatively similar size and population, and as I said, in terms of GDP uh, per capita, but dramatically different urban systems. Atlanta here in black, the urban built up land significantly uh, more extensive than in Berlin. Superimposed on top in red, you see the rail rapid transport system, which uh, obviously in Berlin is more extensive. Now, as a result, uh, these urban patterns produce very particular types of uh, accessibility. In Atlanta, uh, we have more than 90% uh, of the people relying on the motor car only for access. This is a real sort of deprivation in terms of choice in the land of freedom. In Berlin, by contrast, you have more than, by now actually, more than 70% uh, walking, cycling and taking public transport. And by that sort of so-called modal split directly then translates into an energy equation and a carbon emission equation, as we can see here, looking at the sort of environmental uh, bads of different transport modes. For urbanists, for planners, the real problem of private car use in particular is the space consumption. The amount of space we take away uh, from the city for movement, highly inefficient. If you move a car at 50 kilometers an hour easily, you require 150 square meters per person. If you that then superimpose on top of an urban economy which lives from density and from agglomeration effects and trying to concentrate activity, bring people together, not only in office buildings, but also in the public space, creating environments for communication, face-to-face -face contacts, you can see that this is a challenge. It simply doesn't work to have these very space-consuming modes of transport in some ways destroy the fabric, the very fabric that produces a very vibrant economy. In the case of London, what you see here, the juxtaposition of where people work and where people live continues to be a challenge. Every day we will have to move a lot of people back and forth between these areas. This is beginning to change. We're seeing more overlap of mixed use, sort of the living and working coming together, which obviously helps uh, the sort of energy equation. Now, it's fairly obvious that accessing the, these dense inner city areas by private vehicles produce uh, these enormous economic costs, commonly referred to as congestion costs. Uh, what's worse, less well known that in some cases, these even exceed the 10% of GDP within these cities. So it's something really that we need to act upon and consider more centrally. Let me come to my last part on enabling better urban accessibility. And the first thing to highlight is that urban areas, cities, are very good context for collective decision making and also the type of collective, collective decision making I have been referring to. Cities um, are sort of boundaries, uh, artificial administrative boundaries, which try at least to accommodate 
uh, the system boundaries of, let's say, commuting patterns where people live, work, or built up area. It's not perfect, but uh, much better than in sort of the context of compared to nation state lines and boundaries or state level boundaries. Then there are very good opportunities to um, integrate systems, given you have these system boundaries uh, within sort of one administrative unit. Uh, but cities are also progressive environments, which allow us to uh, test new ideas. Uh, generally, urban residents have um, experienced a lot of change in their own uh, lives and are therefore more open to facilitate change uh, politically, but also at a personal level. Governments are more connected to people. The cycling mayor or the mayor who takes public transport is sort of the cliche image, but it's very important that this exposure uh, is something that, that then translates into political knowledge. There are educational environments where people know about negative externalities, what it means if the neighbor is behaving in a way that it's negatively affecting myself. That in itself, itself enables progressive policy. And finally, cities as a unit are understood by almost everyone. So this is a good precondition we can use. Now the concept that has emerged in terms of substantive policies to enable accessibility in the way I've been speaking about is something which we refer to compact, connected and coordinated urban growth, which when built around mass rapid transport can indeed create uh, cities that are economically more dynamic, that are healthier and have lower emissions. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of structural reasons why uh, these kind of cities create greater efficiencies. Transport is the one I have alluded to, but this also extends into the questions of buildings and heat energy and cooling energy efficiency a better use of grid-based energy systems such as combined heat and power, lower embedded energy demand for urban infrastructure, and also then operating uh, a range of utilities is easier and more efficient. And finally, these denser, more compact environments may indeed enable a more sustainable non-material lifestyle by moving towards a sharing economy. Now the second enabling story is all about integration. And this is where cities play a unique role, bringing often together policies which at the national level are very siloized, sectorized, not very connected. Uh, but cities can and have the expertise to then bring these things together and produce accessibility through solid transport policy joined up with land use policy. But I need to stress, it's also the national level that need to sort of create frameworks. Uh, taxation frameworks, investment frameworks that also allow cities to flourish in the direction I have outlined. And unfortunately to date, there are a lot of market distortions by national policy which go into the wrong direction. We also, when we talk about enabling, need to consider that we are at the moment at the interface of two very important technological innovations. The first, the technology and um, sort of telecoms revolution, and the second one, the clean tech and efficiency revolution. And this, like all the previous sort of revolutions in technology will change cities for good. Once again, very different. Um, we don't know yet what is going to happen, but one example that is currently speculated a lot about is what it means for private car use and the deprivatization of vehicles, incorporating them in a much more public uh, shared system, self-driving possibly, could for example eliminate the need for parking. This is a photo I took recently in Kuwait and you can only imagine what opportunities pop up if you take away the amount of cars you're seeing in this picture. Transport policy has been uh, a particularly celebrated area of urban policy making. Uh, we have seen many examples where cities not only informed innovations within their own context, but globally, this is important to consider. And there have been examples where cities were able to break the path dependencies of previously sort of less, um, you could say, sustainable transport infrastructure. Take the example of Bogota BRT, which is now running on urban motorways, transforming what was uh, a motorway into a high capacity bus corridor. We are also seeing a similar attempt in London, where along the River Thames, uh, what was essentially an urban motorway is now converted into a very generous cycling infrastructure, uh, highly successful, and another good example of this breaking dependencies. While these very tangible interventions in individual cities are important, it's also to recognize the efforts by the international community. Uh, Habitat 3 has released a new urban agenda. This matters, this is important, as much as the national policy frameworks I have referred to. And still, ultimately, it is the configuration, the physical environment at the level of the metropolitan region, as we're seeing it here, as well as at the level of neighborhoods, which urban policymakers can shape, which will enable the new climate economy. Thank you very much.